The autonomic nervous system is our topic of discussion today, and it consists of motor neurons that innervate smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and glands, and help make adjustments to maintain homeostasis, and they operate on the subconscious level. Also called involuntary or general visceral motor system. Now we've seen this chart before, and we see it again. Our central nervous system is brain and spinal cord. The peripheral nervous system is made up of sensory or afferent division, and then the motor division or efferent division. The somatic nervous system is a voluntary motor division, like lifting your hand, skeletal muscle, and then the autonomic nervous system, which operates at the subconscious level and is divided into sympathetic, which is your fight or flight, and parasympathetic, which is feeding, breeding, taking it easy part of the system. The effectors of the somatic nervous system are skeletal muscles. The effectors of the autonomic system are cardiac muscles, smooth muscle, and glands. Now divisions of the autonomic system are your sympathetic division, again, fight or flight, parasympathetic division, which is the taking it easy. And we have dual innervation. Basically, almost all visceral organs are simultaneously served by both divisions, and they're in antagonistic to each other. So when you're really panic attacks, nerve parasympathetic will back off. When you're sitting back watching TV with a bowl of popcorn, parasympathetic takes over, sympathetic backs off. But they both work at the same time. If there were no sympathetic acting, your blood pressure would drop dangerously low. If there were no parasympathetic activating, your heart rate would get too fast, your blood pressure would get too high, and so on. Parasympathetic is for maintenance activities conserves energy, this is relaxing, reading, taking it easy, and your blood pressure, heart rate, and respiratory rates are relatively low. Your GI activity is actually high. Pupils are constricted and lenses are accommodated for close vision as you're just sitting around in the house, reading a book, watching the TV, just taking it easy. Now, with a sympathetic, this is our Oops, did that wrong, didn't I? The sympathetic is our fight or flight part of our body system here. And it promotes adjustments during exercise or when you're threatened. Your blood flow is going to be shunted to skeletal muscles and the heart. Bronchioles will dilate. The liver is going to release glucose so the blood sugar goes up so you have more energy to run from the bear. The bronchioles are dilated so you have more air to run from the bear. And then the skeletal muscles and heart actually get more circulation so you can run from the bear. Now, there are pathways with synapses in the adrenal medulla. Uh, some preganglionic fibers goes directly to the adrenal medulla without synapsing. This is still our sympathetic nervous system. So when they're stimulated, the adrenal medulla secretes norepinephrine and epinephrine into the bloodstream, which contribute further to the sympathetic response. This is a little off subject, which is kind of weird, but it's about afferents, visceral pain. And they travel along the same pathway as somatic pain fibers. Uh, not used to having heart pain and gut pain and uh, gallbladder pain, I hope. And stimuli is perceived as somatic in origin, even though it's not. And this is showing a few things that are in common here. Your gallbladder can hurt down here where your gallbladder is. Also can cause severe right shoulder pain. You can have heart pain in your neck, in your chest, anywhere down here along your arm, down to your little finger. So we're seeing the pain in the wrong place because we have shared neural pathways. 
and uh, it's just misperceived as pain from the little finger, for instance. You think your little finger hurts, it's probably your little finger. It could be your heart. Now, a little ticky detail here, neurotransmitters. Okay, cholinergic nerve fibers release the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, specifically all autonomic nervous system preganglionic fibers and all parasympathetic postganglionic fibers. So parasympathetic, think cholinergic. Adrenergic fibers release norepinephrine. So think sympathetic. Adrenaline is a better word than epinephrine. Epinephrine and norepinephrine are both involved in sympathetic response. So this is again receptors for cholinergic, uh, for acetylcholine. Uh, we have specific receptors for acetylcholine and then you have adrenergic receptors for norepinephrine. And these are divided into different types. So our cholinergic receptors are divided into nicotinic and muscarinic receptors. And they're named after drugs that bind to these receptors and mimic the effects of acetylcholine at these receptors. Muscarine is a toxin that makes your gut overactive, makes you drool. So muscarinic receptors one would expect to find in your gut and uh, in your salivary glands to make you drool on yourself. Nicotinic receptors are on skeletal muscle and they're also found um, in the brain, which is actually not in this particular handout, but it's important to know they are found in the brain. So nicotinic motor implants of skeletal muscles, all ganglionic neurons and the hormone producing cells of the adrenal medulla and the effect of acetylcholine at nicotine receptors is always stimulatory but it always makes something act so you put acetylcholine on skeletal muscle it will stimulate that skeletal muscle same thing in the brain and you probably already knew that i would assume that everybody knows that uh, nicotine causes stimulation in the brain, otherwise people wouldn't take it. Now, somebody might say, oh, well, I'm senile. Should I take, should I smoke cigarettes? Well, it might temporarily stimulate your brain, but the issue is it also causes vasoconstriction of the vessels going to your brain and leads to stroke, as well as heart attack, high blood pressure. So it is never a good idea to use nicotine products though they might temporarily stimulate your brain. Okay, muscarinic receptors are found on all effector cells stimulated by postganglionic cholinergic fibers. And the effect may be inhibitory or excitatory, it depends on the target. Now this is a little close up, you may have to look at it closely to see, but we have the two types of receptors here, nicotinic is always excitation, and uh, all ganglionic neurons, adrenal medullary cells, the neuromuscular junction, as well as in the brain. So nicotinic receptors is the effect of acetylcholine on nicotinic receptors, always causes excitation. Muscarinic receptors is parasympathetic targets. It's usually in often excitation, but on the heart, it's not. It's actually uh, inhibitory. So acetylcholine on the heart slows that heart down. Okay, I think that's, okay, got that. Going. We also have a few glands here, uh, limited sympathetic targets, uh, sweat glands, eccrine sweat glands activation, and uh, blood vessels and skeletal muscles may cause vasodilation. As you see, it's not necessarily happening in humans. 
Okay, these are some specific drugs that are pretty interesting that are used, some of them are used in practice. Atropine, it's anticholinergic and it only acts on muscarinic receptors. Now, you can use this drug before surgery to keep the patient from salivating all over themselves. And when they salivate all over themselves, then when you pull your endotracheal tube, they don't tend to aspirate that saliva, and that's a good thing. It's also not if they don't, nice if they don't salivate all over your feet. Also, it's used to dilate the pupils for examination. Uh, atropine is also used as an antidote for specific toxins, such as uh, sarin gas. If you have sarin toxicosis, you have a breakdown of acetylcholine is not taking place. It's a sarin gas is an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. So therefore, you have too much acetylcholine. So let's look at the overall picture. Okay, what's going to happen to your guts? They're going to be wild. So uh, it's called crap your drawers. You're going to be salivating all of your cells. The pupils will be pinpoint because you have the sarin is going to cause acetylcholine, it's going to cause constriction of the pupils. Uh, muscles, uh, because uh, sarin gas is going to leave more acetylcholine, and that's going to affect both muscarinic and nicotinic receptors. And it will actually cause seizures, and death is either due to slow heart rate or seizure of respiration, you know, seizure of the respiration muscles. Atropine, it's not going to affect necessarily the seizure so much, but it is going to keep the heart from stopping. It's going to stop some of the life-threatening muscarinic effects. Okay, neostigmine, neostigmine is not available in the market in the USA. Last I read, it's not been long. Pyridostigmine is used for myasthenia gravis. It is an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. And if you recall from last semester, myasthenia gravis is a disease, it's a autoimmune disease in which a person produces antibodies to acetylcholine receptors. And much like you treat depression by keeping more serotonin in the synapse, well, you can treat myasthenia gravis by having acetylcholine in the synapse or the neuromuscular junction specifically. Uh, pyridostigmine does not cross the blood-brain barrier, so it's not going to make people nervous like it does like the sen senility drugs, the uh, memory loss drugs like Aricept do. But it will have other side effects until the patient gets used to this. Uh, gastrointestinal issues, low heart rate, and then they acclimate to it, much like one acclimates to smoke cigarettes. But it is given also to military troops that might be exposed to sarin gas because it helps build up a tolerance for acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. Okay, now we've got adrenergic receptors. Remember, adrenaline, epinephrine. Okay, so two types alpha receptors, and they have subtypes 1 and 2, and then beta receptors 1, 2, and 3. And the effect of, of norepinephrine depend on which subclass of receptor is going to dominate in a particular target organ. We have a very small writing again here. Okay, beta 1 receptors affect the heart, and they increase the rate and strength of contraction. Beta 2 receptors act more on the lungs and cause dilation of the bronchiole. So that's the, the big thing here. Okay, beta-3 receptors act on adipose tissue and they stimulate lipolysis by fat cells. And that's no doubt to release energy so that you can actually uh, you know, run from the bear. Hasn't worked out real well to get stressed out and make one lose weight because of other uh, hormonal issues. Okay, now alpha receptors, they service blood vessels and the general overall systemic blood vessels. Uh, 
are constricted. So therefore, alpha epinephrine, alpha norepinephrine or alpha epinephrine receptors, alpha one, uh, are going to receive this epinephrine or norepinephrine, cause vasoconstriction, increase and increase blood pressure. Also dilate the pupils. And we also have alpha two receptors, which um, affect uh, inhibit insulin secretion by the pancreas and uh, blood clotting. Okay, drugs, beta blockers. The most common beta blocker is propranolol or enderol. Now, they attach to beta 1 and beta 2 receptors and block the effect of it. So, if they attach to, uh, if you have a blocker for just beta 1 receptors, then you're going to slow that heart rate down, decrease the force and rate of contraction, and therefore lower blood pressure. However, if you give propranolol to someone with asthma, you're going to cause, you're going to block this dilation that, that happens with beta 2 receptors of the bronchioles. I call a generalized beta blocker, blocker asthma in a pill. It will give you asthma. If you don't already have it, you can get it from that. I'm trying to write asthma with this thing, but it doesn't work well. Write it down yourself. Okay, so if one has to have a beta blocker and it, they only need it for blood pressure, then you must select one that is not a general beta blocker. Also mentioned beta blockers block epinephrine uh, receptors in, that make you sweat, your face turn red, and you have a panic attack when giving a speech. Therefore, propranolol is used as a drug to help you with stage fright. So if you have to give a speech, your doctor may choose to prescribe propranolol, take a couple of them before your speech, and your face doesn't turn red and you don't co aren't covered with sweat and your heart's not pounding so fast that you feel like you're dying. Of course, you might feel like you can't breathe, but it's just a short speech. Okay, now alpha receptors. Okay, alpha uh, epinephrine receptors cause vasoconstriction. So alpha receptors actually cause vasodilation, alpha blockers, to lower blood pressure. Now here we have a little bit of specific here, um, classes of specific drugs, and this is a lot of, okay, influence, drug classes that influence the autonomic nervous system. Nicotinic agents, and there's really no need, use for them, smoking cessation products. But now the nicotine patches are somewhat going out of vogue because they have better drugs that don't just keep you addicted. Okay, parasympathomimetic. Now, to mimic is to copy. So mimetic is to mimic. Um, muscarinic acetylcholine receptors. Pilocarpine is a great example because it causes dilation of the uh, drainage for the aqueous humor and therefore is treat for glaucoma. Okay, uh, this is also a drug that's influenced with uh, bladder contraction for difficult urination. Acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. Uh, receptors, they don't bind to any receptor, they just allow acetylcholine to stay in the synapses longer. And again, we have an eostigmine, which is not available. It's pyridostigmine is available now. And this is for treatment of myasthenia gravis. It's also used in our military troops to prevent them or to give them some degree of resistance to sarin gas. Sarin gas, and there are other toxins that are similar. Chemical warfare agents, they act as acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. It also says similar to widely used insecticides. So if you see a patient come out and their history, always take a history. 
their history is we just sprayed for bugs ourselves and we did a great job we killed the bugs and they used a very highly toxic drug that's only labeled to produce by professionals and they didn't know what they were doing and they themselves you'll see them salivating because it's an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor so they'll be salivating they'll have gut cramps uh, their heart rate will be low and their pupils will be constricted and we're going to give actually uh, we're going to give atropine for an antidote to that okay sympathomimetic again to mimic a, a, a sympathetic nervous system uh, adrenergic receptors uh, albuterol acts on beta 2 receptors in the lungs so that's your inhaler that dilates your bronchioles when you can't breathe because you have asthma phenylephrine uh, is for colds nasal decongestant it actually binds to alpha 1 receptors in the nose uh, this is a nose spray you spray it and it causes vasoconstriction and takes the swelling in your nose down sympatholytic to lice to cut acts on adrenergic receptors and decreases sympathetic activity by blocking uh, adrenergic receptors or inhibiting norepinephrine release. Basically, the only one they have here mentioned for propranolol is a beta blocker. And I just want to remind you if you use propranolol, it's, it will lower uh, your blood pressure, your heart rate. It will also can cause vaso, I mean, constriction of the bronchioles. And I mentioned stage fright, but what I didn't mention is chronic use of propranolol has been associated with depression. So it's not really the best drug to give for your depression patients. Okay, now interactions of the autonomic nervous system. The visceral organs are going to have dual innervation, dual innervation. It's always a dynamic antagonism, so you get precise control of visceral activity. Sympathetic division increases heart and respiratory rate, inhibits digestion and elimination. Parasympathetic division increases heart and respiratory rates and allows for digestion and discarding of waste. And they're constantly opposing each other to keep things just right so you don't have it too hot or too cold. Or too fast or too slow is just right. Sympathetic tone is essential to keep your blood pressure up enough so that you don't just drop dead. Now, alpha blocker drugs uh, can be used uh, to take out this sympathetic tone and cause vasodilation and or decrease blood pressure. Um, clonidine comes to mind i think that may be later in the notes okay parasympathetic tone keeps your heart rate slow keeps your digestive and urinary tracts up and running sympathetic division can override the effects of these in times of stress because we really don't care about digesting our food when we're running from a bear and one hopes we don't have to stop or pee or poo when running from the bear and um, if you block the parasympathetic response, you can actually get the equivalent of a sympathetic response. Now, and again, they're both, uh, both sympathetic and parasympathetic are moving together cooperatively. So parasympathetic fibers, this is one particular parasympathetic and sympathetic effect. Parasympathetic fibers cause vasodilation in the penis and giving it erection. Sympathetic fibers are responsible for the ejaculation. Now, sympathetic can cause an entire body sympathetic response. And I think we mentioned in class that the Viagra, Cialis, or some other, I'm afraid I'm not up on my, I've never had a patient come to me uh, wanting drugs to help them achieve erection. Uh, um, Dogs and kitties seem to do that quite well. Um, anyway, but if this is for human things, but it actually causes 
vasodilation of the penis. But if the person has a heart that is in a bad shape, say if this is a normal, if you're looking at the picture here, if this is a normal vessel and then it's been filled, this, this is a heart vessel, it's been filled in with plaque and such, and it's just barely got room for the blood to flow. And I'm trying to change my color to red for blood, but I have no idea how to work it. Anyway, this is blood flow through here. And if you get vasoconstriction, your sympathetic response, it can be the final tipping point that takes that individual and pushes them over the edge to where they have a heart attack. And I think we had a, a vivid, very disturbing example one of our paramedic students mentioned uh, because she actually saw firsthand uh, patients that had died right at that time of their life and it was just disturbing. Okay, effects of sympathetic activation. Sympathetic activation is going to be longer uh, because norepinephrine and epinephrine are inactivated slowly. Acetylcholine, it's inactivated just as fast as you can imagine because acetylcholine esterase gets rid of it right away. Epinephrine and norepinephrine have to release to the bloodstream and they stay there until they're destroyed by the liver. And you, you keep this in mind and know it because a panic attack is going to cause, uh, you're going to keep the panic attack a while until the epinephrine is cleared. Now, function, control of the autonomic nervous system, the hypothalamus is uh, the main integrative center of the autonomic nervous system. You have subconscious control, limbic lobe uh, connects, connections influence the hypothalamus, also cerebral cortex, reticular formation, spinal cord are all involved in autonomic nervous system functioning. So someone who is a quadriplegic doesn't have that fine-tuned uh, effect of autonomic nervous system control because their spinal cord is destroyed. But if you see the bear, it's your cerebral cortex that sends a message to your hypothalamus to send a message to the rest of your autonomic nervous system that we really need to get the sympathetic system ramped up here. And that's all on this chapter. And uh, we'll get on to chapter 15 next.